Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and tunein.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod to make a one-time or recurring donation and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, I am back from CXC, or Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, a festival run by my pal Tom Spurgeon, and I wound up recording five episodes over, well, a little less than 48 hours, including a live session at the festival itself. Um, I'm pretty tired out at this point, but there's no rest for the wicker man or, or something like that. I've got a speaking engagement at NYU about comics this week. Uh, in advance of the New York City Comic Con, which I will not be attending, uh, prep for my own pharma conference that takes place in two weeks, uh, essay for my old magazine in honor of its 20th anniversary, various work projects, and prepping for this Saturday's follow-up podcast with a great rock and roll journalist and historian, Ed Ward. Um, so there's a lot ahead. I had a great time at CXE. Um, in fact, after that weekend, I now have almost a dozen episodes in the can, so you can expect a couple more double episode weeks in future. Later this week, uh, in fact, you'll hear my follow-up conversation with Vitold Rybczynski, the great architecture writer. Right now, you get one of my Mount Rushmore guests, the cartoonist Chris Ware. Chris is known for his Acme Novelty Library series and the award-winning book Jimmy Corrigan, The Smartest Kid on Earth. Uh, he also made the collection Building Stories, which is it's a whole bunch of different books and artifacts, all of which tell different aspects of a story, and there's no fixed sequence to them, and it all comes in a big box, and if you lose one piece, you can pretend that was the one with the key to it all. But Anyway, building stories. Uh, Rizzoli put out a collection of Chris's work and uh, sort of commentary on it by him called Monograph uh, about two years ago. And he's done book covers and book designs and a bunch of New Yorker covers and, and other magazines, all in what he calls a, a highly synthetic style, which is a good, good term for it. Um, he has a very vivid, geometric, seemingly design-heavy set of visuals but he employs it beautifully evoking comedy and tragedy and and the mundane and and all the missteps of our lives done in this 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 look that on its face if you're just glancing at it looks almost like architectural drawings um and that again the sort of design driven thing i used to i used to be concerned that that sort of intricate design for his pages was almost too cool that it built a sort of ironic distance that that kept readers or at least this reader from connecting with his characters fully but that's all over with now uh chris has a new book out called rusty brown from pantheon and that collects a story he began in the acme novelty library series almost 20 years ago it starts out with this uh the single winter day in the 1970s in the lives of some students and teachers at a parochial school in nebraska but it really transforms when Chris starts focusing chapters on individual characters and their lives. And and that's when the design and the transparency of his art all work in service of just evoking the richness of these, these characters' lives, their histories, their futures, their aspirations and, and sorrows. And wisely, the, the chapter's scope each one of them extends beyond that single day. I was concerned that he would only use them for flashbacks and everything would lead to where we were in that, that single day. But eventually they start moving into these characters' future or futures. And um, it's it's just an absolute, well, 
an absolutely beautiful work. Uh, we'll talk about it during the episode, but there are parts of Rusty Brown that left me emotionally wrung out. And I, I compare one major chapter to the movie Synecdoche, New York, which flat out annihilated me. Um, but it's, it's not just, you know, being trapped under an avalanche of, of characters, mistakes and regrets or anything. Um, in this book, Chris really captures not just the, the miseries that are, are inflicted on us or that we bring on ourselves, but the, the longing of, of human life and the, the quest for, well, for empathy as he talks about a bunch in our conversation and, and compassion. And that all made me really interested in finding out, finding out if the time, like all those years it took him to make Rusty Brown, and he wasn't doing this book by itself for 16, 17 years. He had other projects. He just kept coming back to this. But if all those years played a role in how the story and how his approach to the characters changed, like that question of whether working on something throughout his middle age took it in directions that younger Chris didn't imagine when he began it. And as you guys know, uh, transformation of becoming is the secret sauce of this podcast. So all of that said, Rusty Brown is an amazing piece of work. It is another huge step in, in Chris Ware's development and is solidifying him um, in the pantheon, as it were, of cartoonists, because he's published by Pantheon. But you need to keep in mind that Rusty Brown, at 356 pages, is part one of what is, I hope, a two-part book. He says it's two parts. I say, I hope, because I want to live to see the end of it. Um, it's one of the best books I've read this year, prose or comics. Rusty Brown does not require comics grammar understanding that some of Chris's earlier work may have needed, like a, a sort of sense of how to read a page that's laid out non-conventionally. Uh, this doesn't have that. It's still, it's still got his style and his, his visual sense, but um, it's a smoother read, I think, for, for people who aren't comics native like me. So Rusty Brown is a remarkable experience, and I was honored to have some time to talk to Chris about it during Small Press Expo last month. Now, as caveats go, uh, just hotel air conditioning noise, that needed to be filtered out. Uh, and I talk too damn much. You are going to hate this episode for that very reason. You're going to say, Gil, why are you talking? Let Chris talk. Chris seems to evoke that from unsuspecting interviewers. It's not that I was nervous and gabbing. It's just he seems legitimately interested in hearing what the other person has to say. And unfortunately, I took the bait. So that's my caveat. Now, here's Chris's bio from Rusty Brown. Chris Ware is widely acknowledged to be the most gifted and beloved cartoonist of his generation by both his mother and 14-year-old daughter. His book, Jimmy Corrigan, The Smartest Kid on Earth, won the Guardian First Book Award and was listed as one of the 100 best books of the decade by the Times of London in 2009. Building Stories was named a top 10 fiction book of the year in 2012 by both the New York Times and Time magazine. Ware is an irregular contributor to The New Yorker, and his original drawings have been exhibited at the Whitney Biennial, in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and in piles behind his work table in Oak Park, Illinois. In 2016, he was featured in the PBS documentary series Art 21, Art in the 21st Century, and in 2017, an eponymous monograph of his work was published by Rizzoli. His new book is Rusty Brown, published by Pantheon. And now... The Virtual Memories Conversation with Chris Ware. What I wanted to start with was a question about memory. You know, I was, I was checking out the, the interview you had done with Charlie Rose, where you say literally memory is all we have. Uh -huh. Nothing else about Charlie Rose. It's okay. Um, oh, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but it reminded me of a line from a Woody Allen movie, uh, also keeping in, in tune with the, the Me Too times, one of his Bergman-esque dramas, where a character asks at the end, is a memory something we have or is it something we've lost? Hmm. Wow. And I wonder for you what, what memory is. I know you treat it as the framework through which we see the world, but I'm answering well, your really question is, for you. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I mean, anything I say is just going to destroy the elegance of that one quote, I think. So, I mean, because it's it's simultaneously something that we have and something we don't have. I mean, every, everything we experience is, I'm not even sure what the experience of the present actually is. It's not, you can't, you have, it's like you just keep cutting it down to that one little 
slight slice of time, but it's always becoming immediately becoming the past and falling into a lie. And I, I think that's really what it comes. The problem is, is that any memory you have is unreliable and not true. It's cast in language, and the farther away it gets from you, you have to reassemble it, and you hold on to it as some proof of your experience and identity and sense of self. But ultimately, it's 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 just a you know toothpick sculpture or something. So it's. But again, that's really there is that it's all. It's the only thing that we'll ever. Yeah. We that we yeah that we we take from the cradle to the grave, you know. So, disappears with us too. So. But when did it become? I suppose the the focus of what you do, and how you how you create. I think it always memory. was. I'm not sure if I really thought about it that much. Yeah. Was even. there a conscious moment, or has it always just been the? Well, as a kid, I guess I thought more about it was kind of like reverse memory. It was sort of like drawing stuff to make images of things I wanted to become rather than what I was, I guess, you know, and I guess there's always a certain amount of that aspirational quality to what I do now or what anybody does when they're thinking about what they've done or what they wish they'd done instead or what they hope to do. But, um, I don't know. I mean, it's what, it's what, it's what we do as human beings. It's, it's, not we have this business. Some people try and either lie or reinvent. Well, I get you know. Are. It seems as I've, it seems like I meet more and more people who say with conviction they don't remember their childhoods, yeah, which to me seems that, completely that, unfathomable. That's yeah, that, that's well, complete denial. Yeah, and I'll, I've, I've met people even on airplanes. They'll say, "Yeah, I really don't remember anything at all about my childhood," and I'll say, "You don't like you don't remember going to school. You don't remember." eating dinner with your parents they're like no no i mean i guess i did something happened but i don't is and i an, think there's is there an a, age thing or is it a i don't know i mean yeah. i it that to me seems i don't know whether they're they've buried it or if they're lying or if they don't have the facility to i don't know it, it, yeah. but at the same time i think from as a kid listening to my grandmother tell me stories, I realized that her ability to recall things was so much finer and more granular, to use a popular word, yeah. um, than mine was and is. And it's possible that maybe we are forgetting more and more with each successive generation. With the idea that we have too many distractions and those darn kids. Maybe. I don't mean it in a bad, disparaging way, but yeah, you know, there's always more and more feeds maybe I, yeah, I think it, it might have more to do with the ability to record mm -hmm. and put things down we put well, so going much back to, to plato with you know the phaedrus mm -hmm. dialogue where writing is is a sin not a sin writing is wrong because it it takes out of it externalizes our memory mm -hmm. so they were complaining about this 2500 years ago is what i <laughs> yeah. So, yeah but what you know it's you well maybe it's true but i uh i don't know but it seems to me like the more that we more faith we place in in a storage the storage external to ourselves that gives up something in our minds that we're no longer using i don't know yeah. speaking so. of 2500 years ago rusty brown started around that time right was it <laughs> okay 18 years ago but still how did you, how did you change in terms of your approach to that that book which we can say is the first half of of something it ends um with the promise of a second 2500 years from now yeah <laughs> when we're having comics beam directly into our heads <laughs> I, so yeah um what was the process like for i know it wasn't something you worked on continuously for 18 years but how did you change in relation to the book or the story well that's sort of in a lot of ways the i don't know if it's say the point to the book but it's certainly the core of it to try to capture that shifting sense of self, yeah. which really comics can yeah. do in some ways better than any other medium. And I've used this as an example before, but you look at the way that Charles Schultz drew Charlie Brown in mm -hmm. 1950 and compare it to the way he drew Charlie Brown in 2000. It's still Charlie Brown, but they're vastly different. And of course, yeah. Charles Schultz is vastly different from 1950 to 2000, but they're all still the same Charles. So it's all, 
it's there's there's the there's something in comics that allows sort of a concretization of that weird shifting and changing of our memories and senses of selves i think and i it just kind of comes out organically or naturally or unconsciously in in the drawing of a story so are there aspects of the early pages that you you know, you, you look back and I was a very different person when I was. I yeah, was... I mean, there's aspects of every single page, I, even the pages even the I just of... finished. Okay. You know, that I feel uncomfortable or wrong or think that doesn't. And I'll look back at earlier, earlier pages and think, oh, maybe that was better when I approached it that way. Mm-hmm. Or then I'll think half an hour later, no, that's not better. It's, it's, <laughs> so, you know, so self doubt so... is just a constant process for you, as opposed to a periodic one. That's, oh that's yeah, good. I mean, yeah, it's a uh, over overhanging. Mm. gray cloud that's for sure so. now, i recorded with seth as we we're talking about uh pre-mike clyde fans also over mm-hmm. 18 years i think 20 25 years his visual his drawing style clearly changed mm-hmm. over the years yeah. and deep down i think he resented having to you know finish clyde fans in a clyde fans recognizable way as opposed to the the directions his art moved into mm. um do you feel your your work's visually changed over that time? Do you, do you feel that your work has evolved, not even evolved? Um, do you feel like you went through the same thing, basically? I think so, sure. I mean, a lot of it's conscious, too, because... Yeah. Uh, uh, and how would you characterize those, those differences? Well, I mean, I mean, just in a very obvious way, it's the earliest pages are, are it's almost sort of comedic and satirical i was trying to write it almost like a television sitcom Mm -hmm. like the kind i would waste my life with when i was a kid after coming home from school and just turning on the tv and just letting it wash over me senselessly like reruns of my three sons and bewitched and things like that yeah right you know and i just you know i wanted it to have that sort of um i don't know kind of quality of falseness and then I realized, like, why am I doing that? This is the, like the most, you know, counterproductive, counterintuitive way to <laughs> approach something. And I'm still like, not exactly sure. I think it's a way of kind of making something safe for yourself. Like you mm-hmm. start out like, I want it to be this way or to be bad because then I won't have to put so much into it. And I didn't even realize I was doing it. And I try to be pretty, I mean, I didn't realize that I was doing something really so counterproductive. Um, until about, I guess, 50 pages into it or so. I was going to say so. seven or eight years into the yeah. project. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that long. Yeah. Um, a lot of that was born of the fact that the earlier strips that I'd done with the character as, a, as an adult, which don't have anything to do with the storyline, actually. It's sort of like alternate alternate future, I guess, or something. Um, um, we're, we're written in sort of a joke gag mm-hmm. way or something. So it's... But a lot of books start that way as a as a satire or ironic approach to to the subject matter, like Madame Bovary or even Moby Dick. In a way, of sort of a parody of of whaling mm-hmm. um, narratives. So, and certainly, Madame Bovary was a parody of the novel reader yeah. in novel itself. So, and then he ended up writing one of the most moving works of you know basically creating modern literature. So. I don't know. It's I, it's it's a it's a way for a self doubting person to get over some major psychological hurdles. Maybe maybe I don't know. So. Yes, I had wondered starting it out. I only had a few of the installments for uh, reasons we'll get into off mic. So I was coming to the collection pretty mm-hmm. fresh, and um, basically the leap you take uh, with the Jordan Lint story, where it sort of starts moving out of the single day that we've been in. Mm-hmm. So long, even with the flashbacks for Rusty's dad, et cetera. Um, to me, it felt like a major leap in terms of in terms of the storytelling and in terms of you know what I'd seen from your work in the past. Uh, the the complexity of middle aged life that you brought to this um, was just sort of astonishing to me. Uh, seeing how well That's it was nice represented. You. Thank you. Given that I started reading your work when I was twenty, and I'm now forty eight, so you know, I, I kind of <laughs> aged into the, the middle aged. Um, understandings and regrets, et cetera, that we, we go through. Um, I guess to, to that extent, you know, how much, when you talked about getting out of the satirical, getting out of focusing on these, these two kids in, in that age and into middle age and beyond, was that driven by, you know, Chris Ware at 50 
versus Chris Ware at 30-ish. Oh, sure. I mean, yeah, it's just an attempt to, to try to see the totality of life and to get a sense of not only my own life, but another person's life who I'm trying to imagine through mm-hmm. and to find connections or similarities, I guess, you know, between them. So, and, and the way that I approach each chapter of the book is very, that's very self-consciously different. Like the tone of the story of Rusty's dad, the science fiction writer, is very different from the Jason Lent stuff and then the Joanne Cole as well, too. So, mm-hmm. and I tried to change the the way that I was writing each chapter um, as well as the visual approach. So, is that answering your question? It's not uh, yeah, at all. Yeah. So. No, to me it is. Okay. Well, let me ask though about writing, writing as drawing, writing versus drawing. Mm-hmm. When it comes to you know a chapter like that, how much how much do you plan out? You know, is it outlined in terms of the content? Outlined in terms of well, you know, tell me a little bit the, about the process for telling a story within a, a work like this. Well, I have sheafs of notes of things that I you know think it's going to be about and that I want it to be and the shape it'll take. And it's there. Yeah, I yeah, I could sit and write that stuff until the end, basically, and it would just really do me no good at all. Because sometimes I'll write down an idea that I think, wow, this is it. This is the, really what it's Key about. To who they this are. is yeah, yeah, like, and I'll draw a box around it. And I've had the experience of doing that because I'll keep the same piece of paper for a lot of the notes of looking down at another part of the page, and I will have written the exact same thing three months earlier. <laughs> and then that won't even necessarily make it into the story. Yeah. So there's something about. I I very early on as a young cartoonist I tried the you know the standard method of writing out a script almost like a movie script he said said she said kind of stuff and then tried drawing it and it was just, it was like it was like you know wooden puppets being being manipulated by a, like a soldier or something it had it was completely bloodless and felt so far removed from actual human experience I thought this is something's not working here so I uh threw words away and then just started working only drawing with, just with pictures to try to get at the emotion of of experience through gesture and just simply looking at images and that's when I noticed that the images made sounds when I read them hmm. um, which had nothing to do with words and there was a sort of peculiar encoded language to to received images of gesture and what we use to communicate as people not necessarily using language itself and i realized that was kind of this feeling of of life or something that was hidden in in comics you can really feel that in george harriman's um cartoons if especially the ones without his words even though he's one of the best writers in comics ever um a lot of schultz's work a lot of the very early um 19th century cartoonists like H.M. Bateman and, Pe- and uh, Karen Daash, they were working entirely in, I guess, what one would call pantomime or even more inappropriately silent yeah. comics. But when you read them, you still hear something. You're still feeling some kind of language. So I tried to harness that, and then I slowly added back in words and 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 uh, dialogue, I guess. So and that kind of, it kind of parallels the way that comics developed as a language themselves that uh, the uh, writer Terry Smuldren in France very sensibly pithed out uh, the the idea that comics didn't really blossom as a medium until sound was made concrete in dialogue balloons hmm. before that thoughts and speech were more sort of like a vague sense of a notion or an an, an impulse or a kind of sense of something it wasn't as much the sound of words being produced and there's something it has something to do with the ability to simply record and play back sound starting in the 1880s suddenly when sound became something you could capture it became an object then it could be turned back into something that you could re-experience yeah. on the page but then it also immediately lost its poetic power it was suddenly it was something you could understand and so it no longer became sort of this amorphous shape or four-dimensional thing or lack of thing it became a thing if that makes any sense at all i think like i think smell is the last sense that we have that has that poetic power like we really don't understand how it works as soon as we can start reproducing it though then it's going to kill it you know, I, I, well, of course we had the, the scratch and sniff thing but i always have these little spots when i walk around my block with the dog that 
you could smell this slight mildewy thing mm-hmm. that smells like the comic books from the 60s that my father would come back from ham radio flea markets with uh, the slightly moldering ones from a guy's human basement that he would sell in, in bulk. And that mm-hmm. was always the, the little Proustian uh, moment of, <laughs> oh, yeah, no, those old issues of the X-Men from the, the 60s and all Your this stuff. Your Madeline. Yeah, that was it. And, you know, in, in its banal comic booky way, that's the, uh, that's the little banal. triggers for me. Huh. So do you look forward to that uh, ground? Yeah, I know where those corner? spots are, and I know I'm I'm gonna have a little, uh, you know, little yeah. That's that's um, hmm. because I don't remember much of my childhood. I'm just kidding, <laughs> uh, you know. But those are the the things that you know. Again, we we have those triggers. But well, but let me ask you: when you move you, again, you talk about the the wordless strips. You know, moving back to dialogue and sound. Where did the formal elements come in for you? Which again is that that added dimension of exploring time through design and formal play that you engage in with comics you know the way you know what i mean you know, yeah. the way you explode out um i think it, i'm think. i mean that just that's kind of like reverse the way of maybe thinking about it it just looks like that's what i'm thinking about it yeah. comes out that way when i'm done with it mm-hmm. but more often than not i'm just I, i'm I, I mean i just sit down and i start drawing and that's how it turns out you know uh-huh. i'm not thinking i'm going to do a really well designed comic strip yeah. um the, it, the images arrange themselves on the page in a way that i can't predict and wouldn't be able to predict if i was sketching them out mm-hmm. and i try to allow for a constant sense of surprise and it sounds strange but looseness in what i'm doing when i'm composing a page and as i'm drawing not only will the image just suggest what's going to happen next narratively, but also, uh, say, if I draw a circle in one panel and I draw one in the next panel, those line up in my field of vision in such a way as to suggest a parody. Sorry, we're in. For those listeners, uh, that was someone <laughs> knocking on the door to when, clean the When I recorded with Pete room. Bag, we had a whole lot of housekeeping calls when uh, Pete and I were recording here a few years ago. So. <laughs> you didn't hang the branded uh, door no, tags? No, I, I should, actually. Paint. Let me put that outside. Okay. So Mr. Roth is now going to the door, opening the door, hanging the tag on the door, explaining that he's recording a podcast to the... Kind I'll bring housekeeping for people a at Marriott. Yeah. We'll yes. find out what comics they've been reading. <laughs> right. <laughs> we'll see. Finding what, in the trash can. I was going like... to say what what comics people leave behind here <laughs> right. when they're uh, they're on the way out. Um, but that, so that sense again when you're Every doing copy of my book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've got all these one over here. You need to, to <laughs> right. sign and, and you know maybe a drawing if you like. But double bag all the trash. Is uh, I was going to ask actually in the PR for for the book. I think they list. Let me get the text here exactly. Oh, no, don't read that. I know, I laughed pretty hard. Not that I want to embarrass you, but I want to embarrass you. Uh, You're widely acknowledged to be the most gifted and beloved cartoonist of his generation. Beloved? I didn't write that. (laughs) I figured. (laughs) No, I I think I added a line to that Yeah. to try to qualify their nonsense by... I know, it's all sales talk. about my, my, my... mom and my daughter so yeah i don't you know i don't know who believes that stuff to me when that sort of writing public relations writing to me immediately says to any potential reader you're dumb yeah so why would you write something like that why would you try to tell somebody something that seems immediately transparent and carnival barky everything is sales when i, when I worked in trade magazines sh- our whole thing was take the adjectives out Nobody is the leading manufacturer of mm-hmm. X. They are a manufacturer of X. You know, just, just you know, you put that in and, and you don't have to, not everything is the greatest or most beloved, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that, that was just my That's personal inclination. It, you know, seem to be the way a lot of, yeah, I, yeah, I don't, yeah. yeah. But I try to make fun of that. And mostly because <laughs> I just feel, I, you know, I'm just a guy. I just sit around and draw. Mm-hmm. I'm racked by self-doubt to the point sometimes where I can't even work. Why would it, why would anybody, why do people, why would anybody, I guess it's their job to do, to, sell. to, to yeah, yeah, to, and to yeah. call to make sure you got the email. That's also a, a big thing that they do. Uh huh. PR people in general. So I'm calling to see if you got the email I sent and that's, that's, <laughs> that's what, that's what your parents do. 
Yeah. <laughs> so talk about the the crippling self doubt because that's my metier. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Right. <laughs> as somebody who's an abject failure as a writer, um, I ask. It doesn't seem like you're an abject failure. What are you talking about? As a writer, uh, or at least well, as a creative type, this I consider my form very of creation. Creative. What are you talking about? Here? In fact, when I was writing the notes for this, I realized the way questions were spinning off of each other was mm -hmm. the oh, I'm doing the Chris Ware thing, and and you know it's sort of a more associative map of you know the things that I, I figured we'd we touch on well it's nice of you to say but no you're doing the human thing you're doing you're oh, doing the Gil thing. Roth thing yeah, yeah everybody yeah. that's the way the brain is organized the I brain like is the organized in such a way that you yeah, any time you know something is going to spin off but then that will spin off into something else but it'll never be the same way twice right. it'll it's not that's not like a substructure that's all always there it's always reformatting but everything's interconnected in ways that we will never completely understand and it's the role though of art and whatever medium you choose whether it's comics or painting or writing or podcasting of allowing those structures to start to form what it is you're doing and that's what you're doing because you're following your interest and in people's writing that you like and it's assembling itself into a into sort of a, a larger body of work that says something about what your experiences of life are i think so it's a good way of putting it. They're virtual memories, as I, I call them. Yeah, right. Um, how bad does... Well, um, you, you mentioned not being able to work. Does that occur more often nowadays, or are you past a lot of that sort of doubt? No, it's kind of different. It depends. I, when I was in my 20s in Austin, Texas, I, I did a lot of ripping up of pages as I was working on my t the time to work on them then was really limited because I was you know, taking classes. I had papers mm -hmm. due. I had, I was working on paintings and sculpture and art in uh, art school. And I would start a page sometimes just so exhausted. I, I you know, had barely enough energy to do it and it was due the next morning. And I would realize about halfway through it that it was truly terrible. And I'd been fooling myself into thinking that it might be good. And I, there were a few times where it was pretty, unpleasant sort of angry mm -hmm. tearing to pieces and then when then once you do that then you're back to square one and now it's one in the morning as opposed to 11 p.m so but it's uh those were good training moments i think for trying to deal with your own uncertainty and and doubt and I, it's amazing the way the brain will uh um fool you or or in terms deceive of misleading you. Yeah, yeah, deceive you into thinking what you're doing is actually okay when it's really not. And sometimes vice versa too. So and I I I for a long time I tried to figure I tried to spend a lot of time trying to find a, a reliable rubric for determining whether something was any good or not. For a while I thought like okay, if I think it's really bad, that means it might not be so <laughs> bad. Yeah. If I feel then, this way then yeah. Right, and then I would, you know, think like okay, that I feel awful about this, so it must be a little bit better than the last one that and I no, it would still be terrible. I was feeling awful about it because it was truly awful. Yeah. Then I'd be working on another page and feeling truly awful and it would end up being better than the last one. So mm -hmm. there's no really what you have to do is kind of try to put yourself on the outside of it. And uh, which is impossible because you're always on the inside of it. Yeah. Um, Again, it's so. like trying to assess, you know, uh, trying to assess any sort of you know mental issues or, or problems. I um, once had a bad reaction to an antibiotic where I went into a paranoid state for a couple of days, and mm -hmm. inside of it, you don't realize that's what you're going through. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a little moment of clarity about three days into it where I realized, oh, my wife isn't trying to kill me. This has to be a result of that that antibiotic I started taking a couple of days ago. Let me call the doctor and see. And they said, "Oh yeah, it's a rare side effect, but we'll take you off of that immediately." But well, when you're nice in it, of them. yeah, you, you don't know because it's your own mind. How you, can an antibiotic cause a just paranoid? weird? Were you having paranoid delusions, or did you just feel? I, I was. I suspected my wife and my coworkers were trying to poison me for several days. That's like schizophrenia yeah. almost. And, That's weird. Yep. And that so, was, what would that does that suggest then that the that the antibiotic was somehow affecting your you know like biome or something yeah, in a way like some all sort of those body little... chemistry thing that leaked up to the brain oh, and got man. me you know. But again, when something's in your mind, you can't yeah. assess it the way you can as an outside observer. So, yeah, that's and I guess it's a big. You know, uh, the surface of your comics, you know, the the sort of precision and polish of them make it look as though everything is so carefully considered and designed. But mm -hmm. again, the way you're you're framing it, it really seems as though it's 
that's an inter- incidental quality to what well, it's you're just doing. simply an attempt at clarity. Yeah, I said this many times before, yeah, yeah. but it's it's the difference between reading something in its original manuscript versus reading it typeset. So I think of it as typesetting. Mm-hmm. What goes on behind it is a complete tangled, uncertain uh, mess, but the result of it, I want it to be as clear as possible. It's, that's the way I experience life. Everything feels pretty certain to me. Like I walk down the hallway to come to your room and knock on the door. Everything seems pretty certain. But what's actually going on in my mind is a, is a, is a train wreck of uncertainty and, and anxiety. I and, like being uh, able to induce that in somebody else as opposed to myself. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're operating on the same... Um, I think part of the, the reason I do this well is because I have so much anxiety about every single person I sit down with. So, yeah, I mean, I, yeah. you know, and I, I, your list of people is so. I long worry about everyone. It's... It doesn't matter how well known they are, what their body of work is. I worry about how I'm going to do. Yeah. With them. And, well, you just do well, and I mean, it's yeah. you know, if you're just talking to them one on one, I mean, everybody is you know, seems like they're. It's you know everybody's more or less happy to kind of talk about themselves. Yeah, some people, some so, people get weird. But, yeah, you know. oy, you must be really a very anxious person. <laughs> so, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, it's just the I figure that's that's it's worked for me this far, and I'll I'll keep rolling with it. Um, in those terms, then, what do you feel you've gotten better at as a storyteller? I'm, or as an artist. I don't know if I would get better, but I'm trying to get better at just imagining other people. That's kind of the whole point. That I raises think, a question so. that I've actually had for a while, not about you and, and your work, but but that came up for me. Is empathy something we have to build like a muscle, mm-hmm. or is it something that that is innate? It's both. Okay. If you have to build it, is it's it, like is seeing. it, is it I genuine? Mean, seeing is innate, but you, or looking is innate, but you have to train yourself to see. Okay. And you should always be trying to see ever better or listen ever better. Mm-hmm. And empathy is really the, it's the, it's the, uh, it's, it's really, it's like the most important thing that any person can exercise or try to, to get better at. It's what we do as, as human beings. That's the whole point. That's why we're here. That's what yeah. makes us what we are and the, the what you have to do in order to do that is to use your powers of imagination and understanding and everything that you've experienced so far to try to understand what other people are going through and what their lives might be like it might be completely wrong and probably is completely wrong like my when you say your wife i suddenly have an image in my mind of what your home life could be like it's completely made up i have no idea but it's it goes into my file folder about my understanding of what you or what your daily life might be or to try to get a sense of that it's almost a unconscious thing i think that we do but it's as as people there's there's no more important thing we can do to try to make the world a better place for the brief time that we're here so that we're not all so miserable you know so that we don't feel that it's the right thing to do to take people's lives or take advantage of them or lie to them or or not care whether they're they're in a worse circumstance or, or state or misery. Is that that seems to me what a lot of. I mean, that's what that's on the other side of things. That's the history of human conquest. I guess you know it's disgusting to come in and take what you want or and take advantage of other cultures and other people. That's not we're not going to get anywhere if we keep doing that. And unfortunately, at this moment in our in our checkered history as a nation, we seem to have fallen back on those tried and true, very simple methods. So, yeah, how it was a very interesting, well, tumultuous eighteen years during which Rusty Brown, the first part was was created. Mm-hmm. How do you feel it reflects yeah. America over that that span no from from Bush to Obama to Trump? But were, did you feel conscious at any point of of the outside world oh sure yeah i mean i listen to the news all the time and read the the yeah. newspapers somehow it got in there but i did very rarely would i address it directly in the comics maybe in the jason lynch story a little bit since mm-hmm. that the structure of that was designed so that every page is a particular year so there might be yeah. a year that would mesh with what was actually going on then in a real world um I think maybe it, it it certainly would have something to do with the way that I was drawing into the things that I was writing about. I don't know if I would have started that first dumb chapter writing in that 
in that sort of television mode of the way that I understood the world when I was eight years old, if it had been 2014 necessarily, I might have thought, that's why would I even do that? But for yeah. some reason in the in the in 2000 that seemed okay i guess i don't know i can't you know there's no i could yeah, lie right. to you and try to come up with a reason but i no, you know it's I, you know, I just wasn't sure if you felt that there was a i don't even say a need but you know that that desire to, to comment on on you know today's world through a work like this you well know. it forms us all certainly is a uh, very much apparent in the past three years so hmm. I, you know, it's it's and for those of us who might have been feeling more apolitical in our youth, it's kind of hard to be that way now. I think yeah. so. <laughs> and parenthood ties into that. You became a parent mm -hmm. during the course of of creating this, mm -hmm. without getting all Paul Reiser, you know, fatherhoody type. How was that experience for you? And how did it impact your, your, not just your art, but, you know, working life, mm -hmm. uh, helping rear a child? It changed everything. I mean, yeah. it was the single best experience of my life. Um, it, I've said before, but it's sort of like the BCAD thing, mm -hmm. you know, like before my daughter was born, I was a different person. And then right after I'm, yeah. I'm a much, I think, I hope better person. It takes you out of yourself in a way. And you suddenly become orbital rather than central. And you see, it, it allows you, it, it takes you back to your own memories of yourself and reassesses your sense of yourself in the world and puts all your love and energy into, into another person. You know, that's why, again, that's why we're here. We're not, you know, not here to draw comics. We're here to be better human beings be better yeah right and uh, hopefully be good parents too and also it had me because yeah, i never knew my dad and the the father figures that i had were i kind of had it was sort of like i could pick and choose who my father figures were so then when i got to be my own father i could try to be i wasn't really I was gonna add, is it a sort of corrective in that respect to, maybe a little bit sure yeah. yeah i think you know i it's i mean my generation you know, we had a lot of divorced parents, that's mm -hmm. for sure. And I know that I did not want to, you know, be a, don't want to end up as a, have a child who has to visit on weekends or something like that, you know, even as difficult as being a parent might be. Or, but uh, Which were the portions of the Lint chapter that really just, I, I child of divorce, so, yeah. you know, there were moments I'm like, oh, God. <laughs> and I, I went through this. I know what this this whole uncomfortable scenario is going to be like. You know, let me introduce you to my girlfriend now. You know, all, all the... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Pretty awkward. The, yeah, then suddenly we're all of a sudden where a, a parent was you, somebody who was looking after you and all of a sudden that sort of selfishness and self-centeredness then comes to the fore in a really horrible way. And that, you know, like here's a person all of a sudden you're supposed to care about as your new mom or dad or something really ugh, i don't know so then again it's life whatever so yeah. it's different and for everyone so without any big spoiler also um the first part of rusty brown does end with with a different version of that um, mm -hmm. with a, a child and parent reassessing who they are mm -hmm. um did you ever think you were going to be the subject of a paris review Writers no. at Work interview? No, of course not. Okay. No, <laughs> Just, I, don't, I don't know what, uh, yeah, I don't know what they were thinking there. So somebody, yeah. they must, somebody must have bailed <laughs> at the last minute or something. So did you used to read the, uh, the, the Writers at Work, those, those interviews and yeah, such? Sure. I mean, you know, yeah. you see the list and then all of a sudden you're, yeah. you know, you think, but you can't put any, I just assume it's like a mistake. Yeah, of course. Or There's always, so, a, anytime yeah. I get, get praise for anything yeah um i always assume they have no idea what they're doing but but you know did the well how important were the the sort of literary influences to you uh in balance with the cartooning influences that mm -hmm. you had growing up you know what point was the oh, very important uh, i mean um i've kind of spent my life trying to to read every great book that i can that i think i should read you know the time is limited so um and I and as a kid in school, 
I, I can point very specifically to moments where I was assigned particular books in school to where they changed my life, you know, and it's, I, you know, I think it was in seventh grade, I've written this story before, I, uh, we were assigned out of Africa, mm -hmm. and I just did not want to read it, and I didn't read it, and we had to do a project, so I, just, I did a poster board, and I just drew the the continent. continent of Africa and then drew like <laughs> arrows coming out of it or something like that. And <laughs> it's like some of the worst moments of my childhood handing that into my teacher and her looking at me like, okay, you didn't read this book. And I said, well, uh, kind of. And she's like, okay. And she handed me Steinbeck's of mice and men and said, take this home and read it tonight. And if you don't read it, then you get an F. And if you do, and then you can write something about it. I thought, okay. So, and I went home and I felt like, God, why is she doing this to me? But she was right. I did it, you know, and it yeah. shouldn't have done that. And I sat at my mom's, she had an antique secretary um, desk, and I sat there and forced myself to sit down and start reading the book just to, you know, and uh, about three quarters of the way through it, I was sitting there in tears. Mm -hmm. It's like one of the, it was the first time that I'd ever been so profoundly moved by any reading experience. And um, I didn't know that a book could do that. Up until that point, I'd been reading science fiction and comic books and not realizing it, it was that writing could get it some feeling like that or that I even necessarily had feelings like that. So, and I was, I've been grateful to that teacher. Jackie Byers was her name yeah. ever since. So I cried at and, the end of your book. Oh, well, that's nice of you. I'm okay. sorry. That's uh, okay. okay. It was, I was emotionally annihilated by the end of the Lint chapter the way I haven't been since the first time I saw Synecdoche, New York, which... Oh, wow. That's one of my very favorite films. I yeah, which it reminded me of in, in numerous ways. Hmm. Well, and that's high praise. Yeah, I finished that one and just closed the book for a while. And my wife, over in the living room, she heard the sigh. She's like, is something wrong? I'm like, I just, I need to put this down for a little while. <laughs> I'm just, I'm a little bit emotionally annihilated right now and came over, watched some TV with her and then... Yeah, the next day, sat down and finished the, the book and was... Yeah, well, that's very kind wrought. of you. Well, you, yeah. you did an amazing job. Um, are there... Well, yeah, you talk about great books throughout time. Obviously, you mentioned Melville and Flaubert earlier. Mm -hmm. The modernists in particular, given the focus on memory and, and structure and, and you know the sort of models, like the model of a snowflake that I think you'd mentioned mm -hmm. for uh, Rusty Brown... Yeah, or is that a particular era or, you know, again, the Joyce, Proust, Durrell, even with the Alexandria Quartet, mm -hmm. um, something that stands out for you? Or is it just, again, I'll these are the sort of stories that I tell? Oh, no, definitely Ulysses. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. if you're asking, like, what books have really... Yeah. Yeah, I think that's probably... I can't decide if that's... I always got to go back and forth. Is yeah. that the best book ever written or is it Anna Karenina? Or, no, is it War and Peace? No, maybe it's, maybe it's you know, Moby Dick. Maybe it's... Remember the things past. I can't decide, but I think that may be, there's something about that book that captures, he was able to do things with language that nobody's been able to do before. Mm -hmm. and people can do little pieces of what he did. Yeah, but to extend it over. But to do what he did in that sort of large, that book doesn't feel, I mean, it's funny because it's, of course, one day, you know, but it feels so round, the whole thing. It just feels like a sphere. But when, you, when you're done reading it, it yeah. has this weird shape to it that pretty much any other book I've ever read feels like a line, but that book feels like a, sh does it make any sense? No, no, I, I don't know. I use so. that exact description for two Thomas Pynchon novels. Oh, yeah? um, mm -hmm. I, I explained Mason and Dixon ultimately as a line and gravity's rainbow is an arch. You hmm. know, it, yeah. It's the arc yeah, of a rocket. It's, but in, in, in its prose and everything else, it also has this, this sweepingness to it where Mason and Dixon's very nice, but it's about a line and it is a line. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, some books can have that that totality. I, I I always throw this out because it's one of those snooty things I can say that that other people haven't read. Uh, Anthony Pohl's uh, A Dance to the Music of Time, mm -hmm. uh, the twelve okay. novels there. They only add up to about well, they're each about two hundred and fifty pages, so they're not gigantic, but it's three thousand pages when you add them all up. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a not just because of a certain cyclical nature to some things that happen in it, but there is this feeling of immensity in an entire world mm -hmm. um, that, that comes out of out of reading those books that I just reread it um, this straddling eight, uh, 2018 and 19 um, 
and it was it was more meaningful. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. Okay. The first time around, I don't know what your um, what your habits are like for this stuff. The first time around, I read one book a month. Mm -hmm. And no matter when I finished it, I wouldn't, because I was afraid I would plow through the first five or six Mm -hmm. and lose steam and never get back to it. So I thought, just going to do one each month and and go through. And I did that. Uh, Then this time around, I I binged my way through it over the course of like six weeks uh, the second time and really just. (laughs) Once you know you like. Yeah. And you know what happens, happens. Then you can really appreciate everything else within it. Mm -hmm. Um, But. This is one of those things where I, I don't want to uh, embarrass you or anything like that, but the impact you've had on other cartoonists in terms I mean, it's something Seth talked about explicitly, just seeing your work as he was, again, as he was rolling with, with Palookaville and Clyde fans, made him realize he had to, to raise his game and, oh, and kind of become nice a different of cartoonist. And I, I just it's wonder... the way he makes me feel, strangely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's what I was wondering about, that sense of not competition, but... Um, you know, again, the the holy crap! This is an amazing work. I've got to I got to raise my game too. Do you feel, uh, without naming artists, because it's going to shame somebody one way or the other? Do you feel that sort of thing in terms of you know, if something comes out even nowadays and it's wow? I don't oh not sure, think. of course, yeah, I feel yeah. that way about almost everything to one degree or another. But certainly the you know, mm-hmm. yeah, it's the, I mean that's the whole point is to try to to see what other people manage to do and then. Is, you know, f- see how that adds up to your own deficits of perception and ability to understand and comprehend other people. So, and I really feel like comics is alive in that way too. Like we're, it's a, it's really, it's a, it's a language that's in development hmm. and serious. You know, being constructed right now as we as we yeah. work. You know, what's the, and, and, all of my contemporaries do things that are new and interesting that I think, oh, wow, I wish I'd thought of that, you know, and I, and I, you know, we all kind of lift from each other. And I think, I hope, I think in a polite, admiring way, because we're all trying to get it a better, more articulated sense of what it all feels like, you yeah. know, to try to. I never hear guys talking shit about each other. You know, I, I, I generally hear a more respectful tone from all of you. You get, you came just a little after the, the, the first Pantheon level for me mm-hmm. uh, as a reader, because I, started with indie comics in the late eighties. And it's, it's amazing how such a short time frame can mean so much. Cause it was the bros bag, uh, clouds, et cetera. And mm-hmm. just a little bit after that, in like the very early nineties, I started seeing the Acme comics as well as your raw book, I guess, mm-hmm. or the raw story. Mm-hmm. Um, meanwhile, um, did, was there a sense of, well, did you remember a moment where you, you felt like a peer no. where you felt like these, these guys, no. Kind of brought you in as, as you know, you're, you're one of us, Chris. It's okay. You don't need to feel like you're, you're out in the wilderness. No. Yeah. <laughs> Not really? No, I didn't. I don't, you know, I mean. And you're going to be on a panel soon with one of my all-time faves with, uh, with yes, Eddie Campbell. Yes, which I'm very nervous about. So oh. um, yeah. I've gotten to know Eddie since he's moved to Chicago. A very warm, yeah. very nice guy. But um, His wife has a question also, which I'll share with you at oh, the no. end. But, okay, okay. <laughs> no reading best. upside down. Okay. So. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I mean, it's, I mean, it, 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 I didn't feel like a peer only because I don't, it's like, I don't feel that way, but everybody was very welcoming. You know, Charles Burns could not be a nicer mm-hmm. guy. I remember once walking down the street, talking to him about stuff and just being so overwrought. He like patted me on the back and kind of put his arm <laughs> that, That's what I wondered. Like, those freak yeah. out moments of, holy shit, I'm talking to, in your case, it was, it was a Charles Burns moment. Yeah. Well, Charles and, and Gary Panter calling me up yeah. and in you know complimenting me and certainly art yeah. you know calling me up way early on and saying that he'd seen my stuff and getting letters from robert crumb and dan Klaus when i moved to chicago inviting me out to draw comics with the, the chicago cartoonist at the time and linda berry writing me mm-hmm. postcards of encouragement out of nowhere or putting a note in her strip about my stuff and um i mean every was there ever a point where it actually got to your head where you actually had the, yeah, yeah, I do belong. Or have you always, I get, you know, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> I know ego is important in some respects, at least to feel as though it's worth what you're doing. But well, you, f- you know, you try to do the best you can. And when people who you admire and who have inspired you and you know, you could, I mean, it could point to little pieces of things that I do and say, Oh, I got this from that person yeah. and that from that person, you know, and it's, um, it's definitely, it's, you know, it's a, it's a, 
it's nice, you know. At the so, yeah, I don't know how else to say it. So, how's Midwesternness play into your work? We'll say you know, not you yourself, because again, we can't gauge who we are mm-hmm. outside of ourselves. The strip at uh, the Rusty Brown takes place in uh, largely in Omaha. Mm-hmm. Some characters move around a little bit as time goes by, but. What does your Nebraska upbringing, what does living in Chicago, what does the, the sort of upper Midwest thing mean? A lot of M's. Yeah. Middle, middle everything, <laughs> modesty, you know, not wanting to be um, in the, you just want to be in the middle of everything and kind of hide or something. Mm-hmm. There's there's something to comics about, about comics that very much suits the sort of center of the country, I think. Yeah. I've joked before that New York is, is the capital of reading and Los Angeles is the capital of seeing and somewhere in between the two is, <laughs> yeah. is Chicago and the Midwest or so. I don't know. I mean, it's, there's, there's a, there's an innate inferiority complex to the middle of the country, which I feel very comfortable existing in. There's mm-hmm. sort of a, a suspicion of a, of a sense of, um, of, I don't know, a, you know, just a, a tier system or something that you don't, that doesn't really apply in Midwestern cities. Everybody's just a person, yeah. you know, and, and I like that. And I try to get it that sort of warmth, I guess, for as, as much as I am capable in my stories to try to get at that. So, um, is there an but, irony to you being a, a New Yorker cover person? Did it, did it feel funny to you to, <clears throat> my work is on this, you know, urbane magazine that's that's you know geared towards a very different world than than, i guess yeah i mean sometimes i feel like i'm reporting from the from the midwest for it you know um i i don't really i I do try to draw scenes sometimes in new york because i visit there probably more than anywhere else um and it's probably my favorite city to visit anywhere but it's I always feel like I'm on the outside looking yeah. in a little bit. Never so. been tempted to go Park Slope, Chris Ware. That's a- <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, I've been I've been writing some stories that are kind of set there and yeah. set back in Chicago. But um, I mean, it's just because the New Yorker is the only place left that yeah. will publish a uh, drawing on its own terms. Hmm. That's the I don't understand why editors of other magazines don't realize that the second you put type on a drawing, you ruin the drawing and you're telling people what to think. But that it's very much an editor's decision because editors want to tell the readers what to think. Yeah. The New Yorker still has, and it wasn't unusual at all when the New Yorker started. That was the magazines yeah. where they were unadulterated images on covers. Every magazine was like that. There was no explanatory text saying inside we get at the truth of this or that. It was just a drawing of something or an image of someone. And there's a, there's a, a sense of, of letting something live on its own that somehow survived up into now just the New Yorker and maybe some weird like fringe art yeah. magazines. But it's the only place where if you do a drawing and send it in, it it, it can have some of the, the same gravitas that a, that a painting on the wall might have. Hmm. So Have you done, um, not topic of the week, but, you know, like immediate covers for Francoise or have you been more the... This is a seasonal thing. I did and, one, I think. Yeah, I did one for uh, the, the Houston yeah. hurricane flood that I okay. think just, just came out horribly. I just realized that's not my... That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Are you more of a considered... You I, know, yeah, I don't know what I am. I, just, I mean, <laughs> I, have a, I have pages and pages of cover ideas mm-hmm. and that I'll go through sometimes and think like, oh, maybe I'll try this one or something, you know. Yeah. But I'm... Yeah. So, yeah, I'm not a topical. I tr- I can't do editorial. That's, yeah, that's what I'm wondering. Could it be a? I know you want to see something from me, but that's just not the vibe, no, not the speed. That uh, yeah. I, th- I mean, there's people who are good at that. Yeah, and I'm not. Oh yeah, so that's all. I don't mean it in yeah. a derogatory way. It's just if it's no, not your style of making something. But um, serial or standalone? Uh, in terms of what do you prefer? Most of your work is oh. serialized and then collected. The serialization is just sort of a was a, is was kind of you know keeping to my origins I guess as of doing the comic book yeah. for a while. I'm not sure if I'll keep doing that, but it's a way to just keep because it takes so long to That's do. Yeah, just to as John Updike said, just to remind people that you're not dead or that you're still here yeah. or something. <laughs> so I, I know there's all those considerations that go into, and of course yeah. there's the financial you know getting paid per installment. That's a, yeah. That's but, an issue. You know, is that a for, you did building stories as a 
It's a weird project, but it's a standalone thing. It's not something that's serialized. Um, it kind of was uh, in pieces here and there. Yeah. So, yeah, I, yeah, it's. Would you do something? Do you think you could do something as purely take in advance and go write and draw for five years? And I, don't know. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I guess I've kind of done that a little bit with this, with the last chapter, but um, it takes so long. And I think editors don't understand that. I think they, a lot of editors think that drawing comics takes less time than writing, just simply because it takes less time to read for them. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. Um, sometimes I'll get asked to do a book review, but they will, the editors will ask me to do it in comic strip form. I'm like, well, that will take <laughs> three times as, you know, yeah. five times as long. The book will come out in paperback by the time. I <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's done. Yeah. So I don't, yeah, it's... Um, yeah, it, it's any for anyone who hasn't actually tried to draw comics. It's mm. uh, it's a time. Is there a sense that through serialization, the feedback is also does the feedback matter? Of course, it matters. But I yeah. try to, you know, I don't. I, I don't know. Uh, I I, you know, I always hear the I don't read my reviews or I respond angrily through sock puppets to, to bad reviewers <laughs> and yeah I don't know what a uh, yeah I don't seek it out and uh, if I see one though of course I can't help but not read it mm -hmm. so and it's usually somehow painful and um, is it more peer feedback that, yeah that it's more, to you? yeah certainly you know my friend Ivan Brunetti and I oh, get yeah. together every every week for what we kind of refer to as our complaining it's almost like therapy in a way <laughs> yeah. so we can i think he's probably the one person if you want to use the chaise instead of the chair we can, we can oh do yeah, this there as it a therapy is. Session right. too, yeah. um yeah I, th I mean he's the one person i can i really feel like i'd say anything to and i hope mm -hmm. he feels the same way you know he's really a great friend and incredibly smart and extraordinarily well educated and and uh I, we share a lot of the same mental difficulties and concerns and well his effects. his early comics um when i recorded with him many years ago uh the the thing i was most astonished by was simply the person who did schizo one two and three was alive in, in 2010 <laughs> because that person was filled with such self-loathing and and yeah. looked to be on such a horrible path and he was like yeah i think things changed a lot of good psychiatric treatment and, and medication that, that helped and, and, you know, Buddhism and everything else. And then the idea that that person grew into a New Yorker cover cartoonist and, mm -hmm. and an instructor. And He's in a fact, great teacher. He's yeah. really a wonderful teacher. And that's evidenced by so many of the great cartoonists that have come out of his classes. And they all love him. Like I've been to a couple of, he'll set up exhibitions on his own time and his own dime frequently yeah. or publish the collections of the stuff that like the line work that that's all him doing all of that stuff. And I'll go to the exhibitions and it's so clear. All of these, these students just adore him, you know, and there've been times too where he's even kind of suggested that cause he doesn't have any kids of his own that he kind of thinks of him in a lot of ways in sort of paternal way. And Ivan is one of the warmest and most generous people I've ever met. He really is a very giving human being. So. Yeah, I had no idea what to expect from that that mid '90s jump to 2013 or 14 when we sat down. I was, I was. He is a different yeah. person. When I first yeah. met him, he was very anxious and very angry, mm -hmm. and that's changed. Yeah. So, how about you? Were you? Uh... Probably. I think I don't. You know, I'm sure that whatever I actually was yeah. when I was in my 20s is not the way I remember myself. Of course. Yeah. Because, yeah. You know, in the same way that you, you know. I'd be horrified to see a picture of me when I was 17 and see the <laughs> shirt from Chess King that I'd bought or something in the <laughs> mall that I proudly wore to school one yeah, day. You know, proudly, so, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll show you the picture from college where I look like Napoleon Dynamite uh, yeah. with just this giant hair and, and the glasses and everything else. It's, it's, yeah, I had some yeah. of that going on. Too, I like so. to look back at those uh, just to Humbly. remind myself. Of, right. Yeah. <laughs> no, it gets better, Gil. It's, it's okay. Um, do, you, <laughs> do you wish you'd been able to study cartooning as cartooning? I used to, but now I think it's good I didn't. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, I think like you think back to the beginnings of American architecture and Louis Sullivan and John Wellborn Root and people like that. There really wasn't a way of studying architecture except maybe by going to the like Sullivan did going overseas. Yeah, I've got an episode. I did one with him already. We did another one that's coming up soon with Vithold Rybczynski, the great architecture writer and critic. It says same thing. Yeah, you, mm -hmm. architecture is not 
a set of principles. Mm -hmm. Even now, it, it's that it, it's more of a practice, but it involves seeing, mm -hmm. you know, and, and going to those. Things. But sorry, I'm, I'm oh no, that's fine. The, sounds interesting. The idea of, of learning comics versus well, it seems to me like back. Then I could be wrong, but architects were almost seen as poets, you know, and it was the role of the engineer to figure out a way to make that yeah, how to make poetic it sensibility real in a lot of ways. And now that's, and to try to codify that into a curriculum uh, can in a lot of cases be very destructive to the core of what it is that made it interesting in the first place. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm a little bit leery of comics teaching. I think Ivan's done an amazing job. I think Linda Barry is just, you know, she's like a shaman. She's able yeah. to somehow keep that uncertain molten core going at the very middle of it. And because she's constantly blowing up her idea of what it could be, bringing in completely contradictory ideas and working with scientists and people like that. Hmm. Um, as long as that keeps going on, I think that's great. But it's, if you get it down to sort of a methodology of, of you know, it, this is how you do it. And, yeah, yeah, that's very, very not good. That's stultifying. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I did record with Scott McLeod here several years ago, where we talked through the pros and cons of of kind of trying to systematize comics mm -hmm. and, and what they meant uh, or how they work, which was always great until someone like you comes along and kind of blows up the the notion of his entire schema. Of comics. That's what you want every artist to do. You yeah. know, that's what every artist should do is they try to, they should try to get a sense of everything that's been done that you can grasp, put it all into what you can do as an artist and then do something different with it and then bring in something completely contradictory again. I mean, that's what Leonardo da Vinci did. He combined the Northern European approach to painting with the Italian approach to painting into one thing. Mm -hmm. Remember the first time you saw your work tattooed on somebody? That's a strange question. Yeah. Um, not the first time, but it's definitely... Is it something that freaks you out every time? <laughs> it's always very... I mean, just the idea of a tattoo, I just... I truly don't understand it. Because I, I can't think of any time in my life where there's anything I would want to make permanent. Mm -hmm. Especially on my body, which I don't like looking at anyway. Yeah. And I don't want anybody to look at, especially. So, but it's... I, obviously, I'm just a different person, yeah. so... Um, but I, have you had fans come up and you got to see this, you know, and, and I've had it happen a few times, maybe not as much as other people. Yeah. So it could be an SPX. You'll, you'll see somebody's got a Jimmy Corrigan on the forearm. Or well, something. it's all, it's always <laughs> extraordinarily flattering to, to think that somebody would surrender some part of their, their body to do something like that. It's, I almost feel, I don't, you know, it feels really, I feel like I should immediately you owe them pay money or them. Something? Yeah. It's a, you know, <laughs> so I don't, I don't, um, yeah. Yeah, I, I never know what to. It's it's a again, it's a phenomenon that I don't quite get the, yeah. the whole tattooing thing. It's one of my favorite moments in Moby Dick, though. Yeah, because that's the moment at which you know what I'm talking about. There's a part I think maybe I don't know what I think it's maybe like three quarters of the way through, and the the narrator, who of course this is the you know the first three words of Moby Dick are a lie. Yeah. Call me, Call me. Yeah, but, yeah, but that's not really implying that's not really my name or who I am. And there's one point in, the, in one of the many discursive chapters where he's just rattling off a bunch of stupid whale facts. And he says, how do you think I know all of these things, dear reader? Well, it's because I've had them tattooed over every inch of my body. And you suddenly are like this vision you had of this kid, yeah. you know, on this whaling adventure who's romanticizing everything. Actually, he's, he's Later yeah. in life, he's just such Inked a huge as... fan. He's got all these yeah. facts and everything all over his body. You realize, like, I'm reading a book written by a crazy person, you know? It's such yeah. a great moment in that book where everything just slides out from underneath you and you fall into this abyss, you know? Yeah. I, I can't remember if I've... It's a book I, I foist off on everybody, and I will send you a copy after this if you haven't read it yet. The Peregrine by oh. J.A. Baker. Mm -hmm. um, Don't know it all. 1960s nature writing uh, of a guy in eastern england following peregrine falcon season uh it's there are mm. some chapters that are like the cytology chapters of of moby dick it is some of the most, most breathtaking prose in the world and some of the most deeply misanthropic uh narration you never find Great out anything about the narrator but he clearly hates humanity and is is much happier just just watching these birds and, and observing the huh. the natural world around him. Sounds good. Um, yeah, uh, Matt Worker turned me on to it, the editorial uh, cartoonist here in D.C. Mm -hmm. um, 
and Very it turns out it's it's Werner Herzog's favorite book or something also. But wow. you know, uh, but I will. If you're we okay with, you know, well, it's very I, nice I, I do that sort of thing because otherwise oh. I'll have nothing to talk about with people if we well, haven't shared the same nice. books. You know? <laughs> One but, of my teachers in art school, actually Richard Keene, who taught uh, life drawing, mm -hmm. I took when I was a graduate student. He had actually taught one of my teachers at uh, the University of Texas. They'd been good friends. He had a peregrine falcon in his apartment. Jeez. It wasn't really an apartment. It was I he Anary? described it as a <laughs> as a two story building without the second story. That'll, that it, that'll I don't work. know down by the lake. Sometime yeah. in the '60s, I'm wondering if he actually read this book because he read a lot. He read a lot of Lauren Isley and yeah, this came out yeah. mid '60s. The author died a few years after. Um, he basically spent ten years watching peregrines and lamenting the fact that pesticides back then were killing That's the, the populations. Um, but God, it's it's Dave McKean and I bonded over that one because um, I wasn't sure. I mentioned it. He's like, "Oh my God, it's my favorite book." I'm like, "Oh hmm. good, let's let's you know." Um, although, in fact, we have a mutual pal who's also been on the show three or four times, uh, Dimitri Samarov. Oh, sure. Who yeah, asks, I was going to actually ask you about how did you, yeah, how did oh, you Oh, Dimitri meet? discovered me through a, another guest. He listened to a, an episode that I had done, pitched himself and his his um, hack, his, his cab driving memoir book. Um, and we recorded then and just became pals. Um, yeah, very interesting. Which, guy. you know, and I'm not that artist. I'm saying we're going to start hanging out after this, you and me, but, you know, it does happen <laughs> occasionally with, with some, uh, some artists. But he asked, how did you like figure drawing classes in grad school? Apparently, uh, same as him. Uh, yeah, the School no, I of loved the Art them. Institute. Yeah, I still don't understand. There's still, art schools are still killing the figure drawing classes. That's, yeah. I figured by now that whole thing would be over and they'd be reintroducing them and that it would be considered important. That's the only... I occasionally get asked to teach in art schools and I'll mm -hmm. say, yeah, okay, I, that's okay. I, yes, as long as I can t teach a, a figure drawing class. And they'll say, oh, well, we really don't offer mm -hmm. those. We want, you know... How to do an abstract right. cartoon memoir for five hundred pen? Something, wanna, yeah. yeah. So, and I and I think you know th those are by f those are the classes where I learned the most about not only obviously the human figure, but about how to draw, how to see, mm -hmm. how to think about other people, how to try to imagine other people. There's no better thing you can do to just look at other people. And it's such a strain, and it breaks down. I mean, talk about like the weirdness of performance art. You've got somebody sitting up there with no clothes on, and all of a sudden, it's socially acceptable for you to sit and stare at them for three hours. That's weird. I mean, that you know, all of the, all of the um, performance art of the '70s trying to break down social barriers. That pretty well breaks it down right there, just because we make this one decision yeah. that that's okay. It, to it's do. allowed in this. This, this one circumstance, yeah. Yeah, so. I went to a, a sketch night at the Society of Illustrators a couple of, maybe a year ago, because Joe Chardello and a few other illustrator pals of mine were playing uh, jazz in the room that mm. night. And uh, I thought I'd fake it, bring a pad, you know, pencil and all that. And I, again, walk in and there's three naked people standing on top of uh, the, the podium. And I thought... I'm just. I'm going to go hang out with the jazz guys because I clearly can't fake being a, an artist <laughs> in this. And and yeah, it's it's these people are here for a reason. I will go shoot the breeze with Joe and Barry Blid and and you know, a lot of those figure drawing books like measuring the figure and using lines and all these like intersect just nonsense or drawing blocks before you. That's just no. That is not the way the and they're even filled with lies like that that the yeah. ear is halfway in the. I remember all that, that stuff from like the the Marvel drawing true. book when I was a kid, and I was I couldn't do any of that stuff, so figured yeah. you know. Well, that's stupid. That you know, that's I know that was John Buscema's. You know, oh, I, I kind of, yeah, I worked through every single page of that book. My copy, I inked over the yeah. you know printed pencil drawings and stuff. But the you can't substitute rules for looking. Hmm. There's no. That's that's where you really. That's where the, that's the first step towards ideas corrupting your ability to see the world. And I mean, that's what language does the second we start to learn it, is to distill, corrupt, and change the world and change the way that we see it and the way that we remember it. Strangely, that's the same, that's the very mechanism we use to remember it, which is sort of a consciousness problem. But I, and I, when I was, when I was took, taking all of these life drawing classes, and I took them all the way from undergraduate to graduate school, I, I felt more connected with a history of looking and seeing that seemed to have been completely eschewed sometime in the 1930s or so. What and prompted that? I, I mean... I just don't know historically. War, no, with, well, the First it. World yeah. War and Dadaism and Duchamp and all of these you know, mm -hmm. aesthetic movements that 
saw, I mean, and very rightfully tried to see the world from outside of human perception. It got to a point where that sort of seeing and reproduction of the image on the back of the eyeball became such a, so, so identified with, with wealth and corruption that, they, that there was nothing left to do but to distance oneself from that and to try to see the world from all sides and all things at once and to like Picasso's and Greece's interest in, in so-called at that time primitive cultures, which of course now we realize is you know, yeah, cultural. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But, there, you know, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it's all wrong trying to, to see. Everybody's going to see it a little bit differently. And I, it just seemed to me like it, it's not like a dead end. It's just it's another way of seeing it. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, it reminds me a little of the, I went to St. John's College in Annapolis for grad school, great books program. Um, I came out of an undergrad institute that was built around design your own curriculum. We're being oppressed by the patriarchy, and, right. et cetera. And after four years of that, when I got to St. John's, I thought, oh, oh, it actually helps to have all of this grounding and foundation before you critique the mm -hmm. entire culture, which my undergrad place would have considered as, you know, brainwashing people into the patriarchy. But uh, to me, I realized it was much more important to, to know what you're talking about before critiquing it um, and, and, again, have a foundation and a basis for everything. Um, well, it's everybody's that, yeah. for shortcuts. So. Yeah. Well, there is, I mean, you know, there is a continuity. There is a building on what was done before, I think. So we believe, and that, that makes us... That that's not universally believed by people, right? Especially yeah. now with the with the advent of the internet. The very uh, class that I taught at the Art Institute uh, a few years ago, with wonderful students, all really smart, worked really hard, and very uh, art articulate and and talented. I would mention an artist to them, and I was still in the mode of when I was in school. I think, oh, I mean, you might like this artist. You might look him up. And I'd imagine that they would go home and look, you know, no, they would pull out their phone and immediately look at the artist and say, eh, I don't know. I don't really like, you know, it doesn't just, look good on a three inch screen. Right. It was yeah. this, this sort of, you know, in, in seven seconds, a decision could be made or they'd think, you know, oh, this looks interesting. I'll look at it later. You realize that everything is at, at your fingertips now. So it's this sense there's no the, the idea of continuity and development is difficult to grasp or more more difficult to grasp. That's not a. The structure of the internet doesn't necessarily allow for that mm -hmm. sort of thing. So, and I and I kind of am suspicious of that in art history anyway. Sometimes I think that that art historical structure was built simply to justify the investments of rich art collectors. Yeah. You know, and it's it's shunted aside a whole passel of really interesting people, like even cartoonists like George Harriman. You know, he's not a he wasn't a part of that. Neither really was Edward Hopper. I was never taught about Edward Hopper when I was in school, but there's a reason why people love his paintings because it's about being alive and being a human being. But because he wasn't collected, he wasn't necessarily a part of that that uh, tradition. Quote, yeah, unquote. I guess yeah. in the yeah, I don't know anyway. Yeah, but that's but, yeah that idea that you know knowing one's history is actually beneficial as opposed to I'm just here to blow everything up. Yeah. You know, which, which again, this is not a those goddamn kids nowadays thing, just a general observation about, you know, the way some movements in art. Well, but it's work. it's just, it's, I mean, it's true that, you know, that is, if you look at the accepted canon of literature that maybe you and I grew up with or something, it's certainly, you know, it left out James Baldwin, it, it left out Wright, it left out Maya Angelou, it left out tons of writers that should not be left out, you know, and that's so that it is true that it, it, that it is limiting and it is corrosive and the same way that every idea can be. So it's, you have to do both. Yeah. You know, they were a part of it all just as, I don't know. Yeah. So. It's always tough. I mean, there's also the intellectual triage we have to do, figuring out how much time we have to read mm -hmm. everything. Even at St. John's, um, where the curriculum is largely fixed, there are a couple of elective courses each year for each year of students, but there is a core curriculum there, and the fights over what gets added and what gets dropped is hmm. like you know Catholic versus Protestant level civil war. It's <laughs> it's enormous because you have a big stake in you know this particular philosopher or writer, and all of a sudden it's yeah but we want to get a little more twentieth century in here, and you something has to get sacrificed because the students only have, you know, a limited time for reading. Um, 
we all only have a limited time, so yeah, I, really I know, but I don't want to get too apocalyptic, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> but. yeah. How do you prioritize when it comes to a when it comes to reading? B uh, your work process and you know your book reading on twitter somebody asked me to ask you what media do you consume which i just took as such <laughs> terrible phrasing for everything um and i'll ask you afterwards you know what, what you're reading question, lately though, so, yeah. Uh, yeah it's just an awful set of terms to, to describe it as consume <laughs> i you know um but you know what's the work process like for you at this point and how do you balance you know writing and making comics and then the time you spend a with your child, of course, but also, you know, reading and trying to, to, you know, get some outside voices. I just feel like there's never enough time. Of course, now, now Clara's 14 and she's, you know, she rides her bike to school. She's got her own life. I'm, I'm mm -hmm. pretty much back to the way that I was in my 20s now. It's like, you know, she's almost like a rumor in our house at this point. <laughs> she's, you know, couldn't be smarter or sweeter. I enjoy talking to her. She's like having another, you know, adult in the house with her own really mm -hmm. forceful and well-informed ideas um i most of the time i spend working or avoiding work i read a lot of the I, you know read a lot of news and um books and i don't watch really any tv shows i'm one of those annoying human beings that stop watching television <laughs> i quit watching tv when i was when i went to college in 1985 back when tv was worth not watching yeah <laughs> um now it's worth watching so i kind of cut I, i'm a fool in that regard i've seen a, a few things here and there but i'm not one i'm not a person yep. who sits down and watches three hours right. a night at all so i'm i did I that can, in the 90s i shut off I, I just didn't watch tv in the 90s and i have no frame of cultural reference for yeah. so many things <laughs> yeah. like friends yeah i have no idea i know it's a show but never saw it yeah no. yeah and i'm happier that way so. <laughs> i think i i don't know i one of the reasons i did it too is i didn't want it to influence my story. stuff because yeah. I found it was like a lot of the stories I wrote came out sounding like a TV show, which is ironic given what I've just said is that I started the Rusty Brown story to, to feel specifically like a TV show. So I was doing the opposite of what I, you know, yeah. but you didn't know that's what you were doing. That's yeah, but still it was there. It's like buried and it's oh, almost like a festering we, cancer. Or we something. have those. You you could probably start playing the theme music to whichever sitcom. And you start crying. And we will know yeah. Yeah, every, <laughs> again, like you're my three sons thing. You'll have Fred McMurray. You'll have the, the legs, you know, yeah. dancing in the, the credits. All that stuff will come flooding back to us in ways that we know if that wasn't taking up our brain space, we yeah. could actually accomplish something or cure cancer. But, yeah. you know, instead, we remember every Gilligan's Island and, and Brady Bunch episode. Why is that in there? Why can't we get rid of it? I think like the younger stuff. we are, things are, are embedded harder. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but, but when it comes to the actual comics making, what's the, do you have a schedule that you work by oh, during the day or are you, well, it used to be, I'd start working immediately when, we when my daughter was very young, she mm -hmm. would actually be in a, in a, in a crib next to me. And when she fell asleep, I'd immediately pick up my pencil and start <laughs> oh, okay. drawing. And I got more work done that way than I think I ever have in my life because, because the time it was, was so constrained. It was so, it, it was almost like time expanded because it, I realized that every minute counted. And then as she got older and older, it got looser and looser. And then she went off to school and I would work when she was at school and then I'd pick her up. And now uh, it's back to this sort of if there's not an overhanging deadline urgency, it's difficult to stay focused sometimes. So, but it's, I mean, it's what I do. So I have to try to, yeah. I, I'll, you know, friends will say, or other cartoonists will say, I can't believe how much work you get done. And I'll say, I can't believe how much work I don't get done. You know, it's, I, I can see how I could use my time more wisely. And it's, I, uh, it's a constant struggle. So. You end up wasting an hour and a half with a schlub from New Jersey like me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm happy to talk to you. Um, other Twitter question that, that came in, because I literally posted yesterday on the train down here, hey, I'm recording with Chris Ware tomorrow. Any questions for people? Oh, boy. Um, and I, I took out you know the long-winded versions of this, but what parts of cartooning give you a rush? Is there any hmm. aspect of doing question. it that, that you actually... It's when things happen on the page I least expected. Yeah. Um, Does when, that come in the writing or in drawing itself? Both. Yeah, okay. it's the same thing, really. It's when I'm drawing something and all of a sudden something will happen on the page. I did not predict it all, and I'll realize like that's yeah, that's a uh, that's what I'm trying to do. That's or, or if I'm drawing a character, and suddenly a gesture will appear that I didn't plan, or just a scribble. I I work really loosely when I'm 
drawing so that the that the doodle lines and the scribble lines suggest because your brain is always trying to find order everywhere it looks and it in if you have a mess of scribbles it will find the gesture and the form and the in the human figure that you unconsciously want and when that happens that's and especially if it's a sequence of three or four where I seem to capture a gesture that I never would have thought of otherwise that feels real that's the that's the best moment of all so mm. the opposite of that is when you're hacking at something and it's just getting worse and worse and then the paper starts to get you rough and you can't <laughs> yeah. erase anymore that's the worst so that's the opposite of that so that's um, a good question though and also working on a story for a really long time and it comes together in ways that you least expect or there are connections there that you don't see at first but were there in your mind the whole time mm-hmm. but they just come out on the page and yes. then they start to line up I was talking about that with with Tom Spurgeon about Jaime Hernandez's great Love Bunglers Mm -hmm. uh, story, which is hinged on actions of one of Maggie's siblings. And the whole sibling's existence was an accident for Jaime because at one point he mentioned Maggie having, I think, being one of five brothers and sisters. And then one other time he mentioned six brothers and sisters and realized in the comic and then realized... Oh, I screwed that up. I guess we got to figure out who the other brother is. <laughs> well, he's estranged because of this and that, and that ends up being the the, yeah. the hinge that, that brings what I think is his most beautiful story and you know two page spread that will make me cry if I start talking about <laughs> it you know, all together. Yeah, it's weird how those accidents sometimes can lead yeah. to something that you least expect. So mm. maybe he even did that on purpose. And didn't oh, everything's it, so. everything's in the back of the mind, mm-hmm. but. Um, another uh, writer asked, um, just having read your or having seen those two sketchbooks of, of Acme work that, that were published uh, a few years ago, do you ever want to loosen up in your you know quote unquote real work mm-hmm. and and work in those those looser you know? Well, I used to draw that stuff. way in comics, and I yeah. just found that it didn't suit the reading of the comics. Right. It sounds um, like what you said. Transparency is really. Yeah, I want I and so I deliberately work in comics fiction in a synthetic, almost kind of artificial way. I keep a diary where I write everything that happened to me in comic strip form, and I do draw in a very wiggly, loose doodle. Is that something really, that's ever looked at for publication, or is that a, it could not be published okay. in my lifetime? If maybe not for a number of years. And Kate Brown told me she has a bunch of strips that are meant for after her death that yeah. aren't necessarily diaries but just things that she does not want published in her lifetime <laughs> i've tried to pick out a page or two and there's always something there that i can't mm-hmm. print okay. so it's and it's all it's all pretty much for my daughter at this point just yeah. so that she can see what her our life was like before she was born and what and she can have a kind yeah. of a weird does she draw she used to until mm-hmm. one of her third grade teachers told her to stop drawing in class and it's amazing how that really killed her yeah interest in it it's it still makes me a little bit mad because this teacher didn't realize that that's a way of apprehending the world and understanding it and and keeping it um but apparently she didn't see things that way so but um yeah last question comes from audrey niffenegger okay eddie campbell's wife all right can you please make the text a little bit larger yeah sorry (laughs) i'm really really sorry yeah it's getting to the point now i'm i'm uh I can't I can't read your work with my contacts in, so I have to read it first thing in the morning or at night once I've taken my my eyeballs out. Then I can sit down and, and yeah. I mean, for I the 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 point of that is to try to make something that has this you know reality. You, the closer you get to it, it's ever more. It reveals ever more. So I'm you know I'm trying to do a similar thing on the printed page. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously there are limitations to that, especially when you reach a certain age. And I feel bad because even when I was looking at the printed book, I'm like, wow, that's hard to read. <laughs> so, um, Do you magnify when you're, are, are you able to draw that, that, are you drawing draw, full size actually, or are you drawing oh, enough, I draw a double size, okay. which is part of the problem. And it, yeah. because I've got some kind of compulsory difficulty about putting as much as I possibly can, everything is still getting tighter and tighter and smaller yeah. and smaller on my originals so that then when I shrink them down, it becomes that much more dense. You're not so, going to turn out like Charles Crumb with the, uh, you know, just drawing, drawing. That's what my diary looks like pretty yeah. much, but it's, um, just folds and, and jagged lines of dialogue. <laughs> well, it's not quite like that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I feel bad. I should print it larger, I guess, but there's something about 
It's a very, there's a weird sort of alchemical relationship between the size of type and drawings. And when I, I did a strip for the Guardian a few years ago where I made the type larger for that reason to make it more readable. And, and I was also trying to um, capture a little bit of the feeling of peanuts in the strip. And just the fact that I made the, the, the lettering a little bit taller and that much closer to the size of the figures, the whole thing felt completely wrong to me. And I felt so weirdly alienated from the characters that I, and I had never had that happen so profoundly before. And if I, and then I redid the type literally a 32nd of an inch smaller and it suddenly felt fine. Very straight. And I thought, okay, I'm completely out of my mind here. There's, you know, there's obviously something profoundly wrong with me, but I can't explain it. So there's some, there was something there, some important keystone in cartooning that I'd stumbled on, I guess. So yeah, we'll tell Scott McCloud. <laughs> okay, right, yeah. So, uh, Sorry, another eight- Audrey. I, yeah, yeah you're, you're stuck at this size. Yeah. Uh, another 18 years? I hope not. Okay, no, I'll I mean, have you I, back on whenever, but, you know, I'd, okay. I'd, I'd love to you know, not have it when I'm, I'm in my 60s. So. Well, it's going to take a while. You know, that's one of the ideas, too, is that it will stretch a good part of my life or something to write this. But, it, you know, I'm working on other things at the same time. I'm doing yeah. two other books, so, but, um, yeah. I don't know. I it's whatever. I, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, but it's it. Sorry, it's a beautiful Try work. It made it. me cry. It it left me emotionally devastated in numerous parts. So, you That's know, great. keep up the great work. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Same to you, and thanks for having me on your show. I'm really flattered. And thanks, I greatly Chris. appreciate it. So. And next time we'll talk about the Peregrine if you have a chance. So. Okay, <laughs> Chris, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you. And that was Chris Ware. His new graphic novel is Rusty Brown from Pantheon. Chris wisely is not on social media, doesn't have a website. Uh, you can find out more about his work by visiting Pantheon as well as Drawn and Quarterly, but just search his name and you'll find plenty more commentary about and, and studies about him and his work. And you'll find all sorts of imagery from his his covers, his book designs, his comics, his graphic novels, however you want to call them. Uh, that Art 21 documentary about him is also pretty neat to watch. And where is W-A-R-E? Now, after we wrapped, I asked Chris, so, who you been reading? And if you want to hear his answer to that and get some extra conversation, where I promise he does some of the talking, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. I'll get rolling with the third quarter 2019 episode soon, but you should check out the second quarter episode, which features an hour of book recommendations and fun conversation with Mark Allen Stamity, David Shields, Michael Carroll, Frederick Tutton, Ursi Soteropoulos, Caitlin Foisy, Seth, Nina Bunjavak, Stephen Guarnaccia, Hugh Ryan, Bill Griffith, Boris Fishman, and Barbara Nessim. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, a patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project that I will someday get back to, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and Support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this during Small Press Expo, or SPX, weekend in Rockville, Maryland, earlier in September. I used points for my train travel, but my garage in Newark was 63 bucks, hotel was 370 my lift up to BWI train station, because the metro wasn't running on Sunday to get me down to Union Station, was $75. So you had food, coffee, etc. to all that. It was around 600 bucks for the weekend. But... I got three podcasts out of it, this, Sylvia Nickerson, and the upcoming one with Annie Koyama. I also bought some books and had some nice conversations, and it was all worth it. But still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the Virtual Memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, and coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. 
A special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Buzz Carter, Michael Hacker, Fred Kish, Annie Koyama, Jonathan Kranz, Kevin Katila, Jack Les Camella, Stephen Nadler, Barbara Nessim, Jim Otaviani, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Armando Veve, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 